Hi, good evening. Uh, I'm going to read you an excerpt from the book. It's, uh, it's in the part called Epilogue. Fly vision is a term I love. It has two aspects. Flying with the birds so that you have an aerial view of your business and a 360 degree vision of a house fly, which is agile and quick. When you fly with the birds, you soar to new heights and start to see new horizons. That is, develop fly vision. To know whether you have fly vision or not is often the hardest question. And you won't know for sure until you reinvent something and realize the new opportunities you've unlocked for yourself, which might lead to great business results. Flying with the birds is exhilarating as long as you keep your eyes on the horizon and feet firmly planted on the ground. That's quite a stretch. And that's what companies need to do to get a clear strategic vision of where they want to go while being acutely conscious of where they are. In order to stay ahead of the game, you need to keep redefining your boundaries. It is often useful to set in place a longer term vision that can serve as a signpost for making high impact decisions. Hello all, welcome yet again under the banyan tree where we quench our thirst for knowledge by interviewing some of the best Indian non-fiction authors. The person you just heard is Sangeeta Talwar from her book, The Two Minute Revolution, uh, which is also our book for the day. But before we proceed, a quick announcement. You have been a wonderful audience and with all your suggestions, feedback and, and requests, we are proud to announce that we will be starting a new series under the Banyan tree called Sported, where we interview some of the most prominent behind the scenes sports personalities and get a piece of tales beyond the field. We hope you enjoy and learn from it just as much. Keep the comments flowing in. You have been a wonderful audience yet again and looking forward to your responses. Over to you, Saurabh. Thank you, Sahil. Today's guest is very special and I'll tell you in a while why she is special. Sangeeta Talwar is a is 1979 IIM Calcutta graduate and soon, soon after kind of graduating, she joined Nestle. And with that, she became the first ever woman in the FMCG sector in India. She spent well over two decades of her life in Nestle, you know, playing roles across various departments. And then in 2001, she joined Metal India as its CEO and managing director. Thereafter, she had a stint and, and well, before an extent, she, she took a two-year break in order to help her daughter with the secondary examination. And, you know, that's how women in industry juggle with their personal life and professional life. That's how difficult things are. But soon after that, she joined Tata Global Beverages as its executive director and regional president for South Asia before, before taking, off and taking on as managing director for National Dairy Development Board. Right now, since 2013, she is the managing partner for Fly Vision Consulting. Sangeeta Tilwar has been breaking multiple stereotypes since the time she joined uh, she, in the industry. And, and you know, not just she, in stereotypes, she has been kind of spearheading and leading teams to create some of the most iconic brands in the ever seen. Brands like Maggie, brands like Tata Tea, brands like Barbie, some of which we are going to take up in this particular episode. But there's one more reason she, she's special. She is the first ever solo female interviewee in our show till now. And as a mark of respect to Sangeeta and, and all the women out there in the industry, we would be airing this episode on the weekend of the International Women's Day this year. So, ma'am, welcome to our show. Thank and you. Happy Thank Women's you. Day, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Shirdeep Sahil. I'm uh, very happy to be here and looking forward to an exciting uh, discussion. <laughs> quite, quite likewise. And and here is a quick overview of the book um, to everyone who's listening. The book, while while we'll come to the title, uh, the Two Minute Revolution, eventually, is a treasure trove of experiences ranging not just from a branding perspective, but marketing, sales, HR, and of course, the CEO, not yet restricted to the only brand that you think of anything of the title, but also covering various other iconic brands which have touched our lives across ages, across timelines. And uh, 
a, a very interesting read, I guess, both from a personal and professional standpoint, which doesn't just give you management lesson, but also aspires you, inspires you to do more, to, to achieve more, to want to be more. And, uh, you know, with that context, right off the bat, ma'am, uh, you know, my, my question comes that with such a wide, wide areas that, that you have covered in the book, right? Do you think that the title, The Two Minutes Revolution, sort of justifies what you have, what you have tried to cover um, in, in the book? What was, what was your, your rationale behind the title here? So, you know, Sahil, uh, when I was uh, working on Maggie and, uh, uh, you know, building the brand, the, the single thought in my mind always used to be, how can I make this brand omnipresent? And then on 2nd of June, 2015, the brand did become omnipresent, but uh, unfortunately, infamously. And uh, I watched with great uh, trepidation how a brand which had been built so painstakingly over the previous 30 years was taken down in 48 hours on social media. Uh, you know, I spent almost 20 years with Nestle and uh, my gut uh, knew that uh, there's some error somewhere because it's not in the DNA of this organization to make such a huge error. And I think it was the food regulators uh, case against Maggie, which sort of nudged me and prompted me to think about who has told anybody the story of Maggie and how Maggie was created and built. And I, and I thought to myself with horror, no one has. And that's when I decided to write this book. So actually, the book, its genesis was really to tell uh, whoever cared to read it the story of how this brand was built from day one with a lot of uh, hard work, dedication uh, of a whole team of people, a whole company. OK, and then I thought to myself, you know, why not uh, uh, instead of, uh, you know, throwing any concepts and any jargon at people, why not fill it with other interesting business stories? And there were many, many business lessons that I wanted to share. So if you look at the title of the chapters, and if you don't mind, I'll take a moment to refer to them. Uh, they all link to certain, um, certain lessons in business. So small beginnings can lead to big wins. Going against the grain to launch a new category. Play smart to be different. Develop fly vision. You get only one shot. Uh, a small innovation makes a big dif difference. Uh, partnerships make for power. Be consumer obsessed. Expectation is the key that drives the world. Never tire of doing new things. Dare to step outside your comfort zone to thrive. Lead and share your vision. And pivot to profitability. So um, that's when I decided that I will fill it with a lot of my experiences, but I will keep the title, The Two-Minute Revolution. Just one other thought. For a brand to have gone through that kind of experience where every pack was removed from this country, every pack from every shelf, and we are a very large country, and this was a very well-distributed product, okay? And then to come back with a bang into the market and almost get back to a market share held for 30 years, 70% market share. I think, I mean, you don't need to say anymore. That's a brand that's built to endure. So the other thought was that if I called it the two minute revolution, maybe more people will pick it up. Yeah, <laughs> no, certainly. And, and you know, um, I mean, I remember, I remember I live in Chennai and my neighbors, despite all the, all the maturity that, that Maggie came under, they would keep 50 packets of, of Maggie, uh, you know, because really, I, whatever the news says, we don't believe it. We love it, and we are going to eat regardless, right? And it was crazy. It was crazy. I could feel the love, and I guess, and uh, I also guess that, ma'am, uh, you know, I could see that this book has been conceived from a from a love that I guess one would feel for for her own baby. Uh, I guess while you have been a brand manager, but the soul keeper, as you define, uh, you also have been somewhere a mother of the brand itself. And that, that shows that, that that's why I guess the book comes across as something which is very, um, you know, personally uh, appealing to to everyone who reads it, at least to me. And so uh, 
and, and for that congratulations thank you thank you so much yeah, yeah sorry, i still i i was reading it again in the last few days and i mentioned to my husband i said I, this is a damn good book <laughs> even though i say it myself <laughs> quick, quick coincidence was that uh, I, when i started reading it uh, about two weeks back <laughs> i started reading it and i generally read books before i go to bed and uh, that that evening mom dad were outside so i cooked myself a bowl of maggi and <laughs> that's how i started the book <laughs> I'm like oh my god really <laughs> Right. And well, ma'am, before we move on to the next question, uh, we have found out a photograph, and we would love to hear the anecdote behind this photograph. I'll share it on the on the screen right now. Now, now oh, to our yeah. viewers, this this particular photograph comes as a very powerful one to me. You know, it's a black and white setting, gives you a more or less an idea of, of of the year or of the decade. And then there's a lady, uh, perhaps leading a a room filled with men. and it's a corporate setting it seems to be a very powerful photograph to me <laughs> and, and so you you cool? you can see i'm very very young in this photograph and because it's black and white it's the early 80s okay so i'm probably 2 3 years old in the company and this is the marketing one program it was held in agra in mogul sheraton and uh, this is a breakout session uh, where um, uh, i cannot remember i think this is mr beg on the left hand side in the front and he used to work the bangalore market and i'm not sure of all the other names but uh, we are in a breakout session and we are doing some group work uh, this was a marketing one program in agra nestle program <laughs> well you know the 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 image that Uh, that i see in front of me is so different and it's so detached from the from the today's corporate environment that i see around myself uh, and and i guess it it does justice to the phrase that a picture speaks a thousand words because it, it, there are so many stories like in my mind when i look at it uh, i guess not just how the so i have to tell you one of the things sahil i always wore a sari to work so even when i was posted to switzerland uh i used to wear a sari to work and everybody used to hear me swishing down those massive corridors of the nestle headquarters I and uh imagine <laughs> at you the, the entire concept of an indian woman roaming around in a sari in a <laughs> that was the only one you know so some of my friends that i made would catch up with me in the loo and say this is a gorgeous dress can <laughs> i feel the material can i see how, how did you wrap it you know because they'd be in awe of, of the sari and the chairman the international chairman he actually um, called me in for a discussion one day and he said you know i really admire the fact that you stuck to your roots and uh, of course that was at one end of the spectrum the other end of the spectrum was i went shopping in a in a in a in a place i had to buy bread that uh, particular evening um for dinner and this lady came and she tickled my waist and she said you must be crazy she gave me all her best galis in french and said you must be crazy wearing this on a winter evening <laughs> <laughs> so you know you had all kinds of experiences <laughs> in the sari you, uh, you know but you had such a wide variety of experiences in, during your stint right right from marketing sales uh, hr you know you occupied the corner office you know right from one end of you talked about spectrum right from one end of the corporate spectrum to the other you had it all which has been the most enriching for you personally as well as professionally so um, you know surudeep that's a, a question which uh, doesn't have a, a singular answer because i'll tell you i enjoyed each and every one of those roles um it, because i think the approach was a dedicated approach a diligent approach an outcome oriented approach and there are two things i want to mention here it came with a purity of intent and a clarity of purpose and each of those roles are extremely different extremely different and actually i would encourage companies and uh, people who work for these companies to exp- to go beyond their comfort zone to step outside the comfort zone pick up a challenge and experience other areas uh, within the organization uh, so let me just give you a, a perspective so marketing was all about building the brand it was all about the consumer and how to make sure that what you do for the consumer is built in an enduring fashion so that the consumer trust what you're marketing to them 
And that was the whole journey uh, with creation of Maggie, right? And that has a very different sort of a engagement. So uh, as, a, as a business head and as a brand manager or a marketing manager, you need to be very collaborative because you need to get all the function heads to step beyond their call of duty, uh, you know, to get out of their silos and give importance to your business. And when it's a new business, you know, nobody's sure how it's going to do. So it's last on everybody else's priority list, but it's top of your list. So it's a very different space. Uh, when I went into sales, uh, and I must mention this, I actually put up my hand for sales. So having spent 10 years in the company and having, uh, you know, been acknowledged as having done very well uh, with the Maggie brand, uh, you know, the next place to go was to go up the ladder. But the only way you could go up the ladder in those days was if you actually had experienced sales. And so I went to my boss one day and, you know, there was a regional manager position falling vacant. And I went to him and he said, what about considering me for that role? And, uh, you know, uh, when I joined the company, there were no women. I was the first woman they hired in India in an executive role. The company in sales had no women at all. Uh, women, you never saw them walking around the markets, talking to distributors or dealers. So it was a complete uh, shock to him. But to his credit, he uh, sat down with the head of HR and they discussed it. And then they came back to me with a proposal and they said, you have no sales experience, right? So we can't give you the regional manager's role straight away because that's running 25% of the country, 25% of the turnover, the entire business, and it's the business and administrative head for that part of India. So you will have to go through a sales exposure. So one year. So I said, OK, so no problem. So after 10 years, I became a sales officer. I went all the way down the ladder. OK, and everybody, the company used to phone me and say, OK, you know, how can you do this? Because obviously there was me with 10 years experience working from the corporate office out of marketing and working as a sales officer. So I did three months as a sales officer. And then I went off as an area sales manager. And I ran Andhra Pradesh. And that was a completely different experience. I had 25 reportees. I used to travel out of two small bags for 26 days of the month. I had a little daughter at home. I used to come home for four days. And uh, my boss, who used to be based out of Chennai, he used to uh, often call me up and say, are you crazy? You're walking in the so-and-so market in the month of June. I, I don't want to bring a stretcher and carry you home. So just please be careful. So I did a lot of traveling. Uh, in that stint as an ASM and you know my business partners the distributors they used to say we've never seen an ASM a male ASM traveling the way you are traveling and you're a lady so you know they were always very um, they always uh, if they needed a meeting uh, they gave me some examples they said you know we called up the company ASM for so and so company and asked for a meeting three months ago he's yet to give us a time and uh, they said, we requested you and you agreed the same day. So I was actually at a meeting surrounded by 20 of these distributors. And, you know, they just uh, said that, can we discuss? I said, sure. You know, so uh, the, the point I want to make is when you come with a clarity of purpose and a purity of intent, it's almost it, it almost leaves you in a space of being fearless. You know, you don't fear anything. So I heard them out. I, I told them, I said, look, there's some things I can do something about, some other things which are part of company policy. I don't think I can change those. But they went away very happy. So uh, I'm just generating a few of the sales examples. Later on, after I finished this stint, I became the head of the northern region. So I ran everything from Delhi um, all the way up to Nepal. So JNK, Punjab, Haryana, UP, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I was the business and administrative head. So we, we ran everything. We ran all the products. And uh, there the job was more command and control because you had the frontline troops. You had to make sure everybody was aligned to deliver the company's business in those areas through the company's business partners. So the business partners, the distributors uh, were people you dealt with because we were we were not a click business. We were brick, brick and mortar business. And uh, business partners were critical. So. I used to uh, once a year um, uh, talk, go and talk to the distributor. We used to have an open session in each state. And in some of the states, you had to speak in Hindi. 
and my Hindi was a little rusted, right? I had studied in school, but it was rusted. So I used to sit down the evening before with one of the pundits in the company. He knew all the hard words. So I used to tell him, I'll tell you all the translations. <laughs> So, you know, it's it's just how you treat it, right? I wanted to make sure that I was not only there and speaking to them, but I was being able to be heard. I was communicating, right? And so those, so those things used to go down well. So we always made that connection. So I think it's about how you come at uh, a, a role. It's not about the role itself. So um, for me, I want to mention an important aspect here. You know, any job, uh, it was never described with a job description. You know, it was always outcome based. You know, this is what you had to deliver, and so you define you define your own boundaries, right? So for me, that was the way I took on each role. And um, very interesting role was HR. And uh, uh, so when, uh, in fact, I from my regional sales manager role, uh, my boss walked in one day. It was a holiday, uh, part holiday in Delhi, but we were working. And uh, he said, uh, you know, I'd like you to do this uh, VP HR. And it was a step up for me. So I was, you know, I said, OK, I couldn't say no to him. He's very, very persuasive. And then I couldn't sleep for the next two nights. OK, because I was very concerned that, you know, they're pushing me into HR. I didn't want to get into HR, but it was a step up. So, you know, discussed, chatted. And then I think it was a weekend. So Monday morning, I appeared in his doorway and he said, oh, my God, no, don't tell me it's you. I said, yes, sir. I wanted to discuss the offer you made to me on Friday. He said, no, you can't. I've already made all the changes. I have moved all the pieces of the puzzle. <laughs> so typically what happens is when your regional manager position got vacant, he obviously moved other people. Then those fell vacant. He moved other people. Right. So that whole chain he had completed. <laughs> So anyway, so then I got him to uh, promise me that he won't leave me there for the rest of my life. And uh, he said, uh, well, minimum two years. I said, OK, no problem. I'll do it. And that was such an enriching role, you know, ahead of HR. It was just amazing. And by the way, I had no real HR exposure except what I had read in a few books. And uh, the person whom I took over from, he gave me a one page handover. And I think a one hour handover. And yeah, that was it. So I was left uh, sort of swimming. And to my uh, uh, great fortune, uh, uh, Switzerland had organized a head of HR's uh, uh, meet in one of the countries within a month. So I was part of that uh, uh, meeting. And that really uh, gave me a very good insight. And I had certain, uh, you know, I had certain beliefs, and I shared that with the global head of HR at a, at a presentation. And uh, she actually gave me a standing ovation. She said, I've, "That's music to my ears. I haven't heard this from an HR head ever before." So you know, that's where a line manager's perspective comes in. Yeah, it's a very different, uh, maybe perspective from pure HR uh, professionals. Uh, but that was an amazing experience. So, 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 you know, my take uh, uh, would be from, from from this answer is, I guess, how you look at roles. I'm not sure if, if you did that as, as uh, during your sister as an HR, but, but you know, when you said that you would look at job descriptions, not as a set of roles and responsibilities, but as outcomes, I guess that's great. That's what a lot of people today need so that they're able to define what they need to achieve, um, which, I, which I see thoroughly, thoroughly missing in, in roles and responsibilities, job descriptions everywhere but but you know here is a question ma'am that of course while drawing from your own experiences uh, right now reflecting on what you just said also from the book uh, you know, I, I recall this, this one experience uh, where you were in bombay which was raining cats and dogs and uh, you, know, you still made it a point to go to some far off uh, shop to, to just sort of get a good ground reality because it was the launch day for the brand um, and, and, you know, in my mind, of course, while the entire visualization is going on, I'm also wondering that what has been this woman's motivation, right? I mean, I get it, you know, clarity of, of, of purpose and, and uh, clear intent are important. But but how do you how do you keep yourself motivated? How do you, how do you keep yourself going? What what becomes your, I don't know, icky guy? What becomes your purpose? What kept you moving all this while? Yeah, uh, well, I think it's um, really a very deep, uh, deeply ingrained uh, uh, 
uh, desire to create value, uh, to do things in a way that creates value for either the company or for the company and its people or for company consumer, stakeholders, society, what family, whatever. So I think that's a very deep seated uh, thing. And uh, the other thing I would say, it's always been in pursuit of excellence, I think. And I think perfection is a wrong word. Uh, there's nothing like perfection in this world. But uh, in pursuit of excellence, so trying to do everything in a way that uh, makes me feel happy. And you know, I would, my sights were always set quite high. So I think that's what sort of kept me going. So that was a uh, very bad flood in Bombay. And this was a wholesale market in Bombay. And I remember that experience so clearly. You know, the cab stopped uh, two streets away. He said, Madam Pani Bhara, why I can't go? And I used to wear a sari, right? And sandals. So I tied my sandals and strung them on one shoulder. Uh, my purse always had a, a big loop so I could hang it on the other shoulder, hitched up my sari. And I started wading through little more than knee deep water. And I was very scared because I didn't want to fall into a manhole. And, you know, this thought of being washed out at sea, I mean, that really uh, made me feel very scared. So there was a uh, I, there was some one innocuous uh, gentleman uh, with a lungi and uh, maybe he was a laborer. He was walking in the center of the road. <laughs> you won't believe it. I went to him and I said, Sir, aapka shirt ke <laughs> can you believe it? And I was holding on. This poor man must have thought this woman is mad. <laughs> I was holding on to his shirt. <laughs> I would disagree. I am sure that man would have been would have been excited. <laughs> 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 it was really funny. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I had reached the distributor shop and he was totally aghast. He said, Madam, aap kaise Koi nahi aaya bhi. <laughs> even his sales rep hadn't turned up. So we waited for two, three hours. The water started to recede. And at but we waited, his sales reps came and then we hit the market at 12 o'clock in the afternoon. But no one else from Nestle came. So yeah, I, I, yeah, I felt that you know it's uh, well, you know, somebody should be there. I said I've come for this, so just let me go. So there have been other instances like this. Like uh, I remember when I was running AP, um, I had been had to had to take some tough calls with some of the distribution partners because they they were not following company policy, and so um, one day I was headed to the warehouse. So we had a big mother go down in uh, at, uh, outskirts of Hyderabad. And the sales officer, I mean, the, the CA, uh, the CFA, uh, the agent, he phoned me. He said, Madam, aaj ko nahi aane, aay, nahi aana. I said, why? He said, no, there's some people here. They are saying they're waiting for Madam and they've got these long sticks and all. And they're waiting in a three wheeler outside the warehouse. So please don't come today. I said, uh, his name was Mr. Barker. He's no more. I recently got in touch with his daughter. Uh, so I told him, I said, no, Mr. Barker, I'm coming. It's part of my plan for today. And, you know, I'm there to support you and your staff. You're working for Nestle. He was a, a carrying and forwarding agent. So I did arrive there. And he was, of course, uh, those people had left by then, fortunately for me. Uh, but he was, you know, he was so appreciative. And, you know, so, so that's how you build trust and commitment, um, you know, of your business partners. And by uh, actually uh, picking up the contract and saying, I'm going to take the challenge, you know, just be fearless and forthright and go forth. <laughs> and ma'am, uh, yeah, yes, I'll go on. No, no, please, sorry. No, uh, I was, uh, I was wondering. You know, this sort of passion needs one to fall in love with the brand you are working for, right? Only then you would go to such an extent to kind of, you know, to to support the brand to you know to uplift the brand but is it something that one needs to kind of one needs to always develop by force for a brand he is assigned the person is assigned or you know it's something if it, if you don't develop it you don't become a successful brand manager or successful marketing manager for the brand it's, it's something no, like that uh, no i don't think you need to uh, necessarily be so much in love with uh, you know the brand but i think it's also about what do you want to say about yourself as a professional 
okay. and so I think one of the things that I would like to tell a lot of young people is that be clear about what are the values you stand for and stand for something. You know, it could be whatever it is, but stand for something. So one of the things that I stood for is I tried to deliver what you, I, I used to love this phrase, deliver what you promise. And I tried to always do that. Uh, uh, and, uh, and I think that was part of it also. Uh, so, you know, I, uh, I must tell you, uh, when I just began as a management trainee, I went on a market visit in Mumbai and I did a market visit report after that. It was my first report I was writing. And my boss wrote excellent report and he circulated it to all his guys in sales. He says, this is how you should be talking about sales. Now, so maybe there was something um, innately, which was business focused, you know, professionally focused, just the way I look at things or the way I look at business or the way I look at, um, you know, opportunities, work them back from the front end back into the company. So uh, I think maybe there's, there's a bit of that uh, as well. Uh, it's not just about falling in love with the brand. It's also about um, what do you want to achieve at the end of it? You know, what is the outcome that you're looking for? And do you want to put a stamp on it? You know, uh, it with commitment, with dedication, with focus, with passion. Yes. Uh, don't. So I used to tell people, I said, don't leave yourself in the draw at home. Bring yourself to work, <laughs> which is what I meant. You know, bring your full, full, whole self to work, <laughs> including your, your your thoughts, feelings, emotions, passions, everything. Pushing, pushing, so so pushing the question further here, right now. When you're talking about your experiences in the book, you you call the brand manager the soul cooper, who at your time would have an overarching responsibility for the brand, right, end to end, where you talk about how the brand manager is looking after right from the production stage to after sale um, aspect of the product journey, uh, the brand journey, in fact. And uh, then we, we, we sort of go on to see how that has become more specialized or might I say more siloed, um, you know, with, with more narrowly defined uh, roles of a brand manager, right? How have you seen that changing and, and what do you think an aspiring brand manager needs to have as quality or as qualifications to be, to be where you were at that time? So, you know, uh, Sahil, um, I don't think uh, the brand manager in those days also was responsible for everything. He was, they were, they were more like a repository, uh, which always sort of got consulted uh, in the Nestle system on all the decisions made on their particular brand portfolio of brands or products. Uh, but the, uh, all the functions were separated. So sales was separate. Uh, and marketing looked after branding, pricing, uh, packaging, uh, media buying, all of that. Uh, there was a separate media department, but all of those things would be done in consultation with the uh, person responsible for that uh, bunch of brands. So, or let's say in this case, the business of Maggie. And uh, uh, I, I think the the role is, uh, I call it the role of a soul keeper is because everybody else is busy doing what they are doing. Mm -hmm. uh, but for your business, you've got to persuade them to carve out enough time, attention, dedication <laughs> to make sure that they're helping you to take the right decisions, helping you. So I, I give you a, a very quick example. Um, you know, there were no computers at that time. And uh, the, the Maggie uh, portfolio had grown to have 27 SKUs. If I take everything, including the soups, the sauces, the noodles, the cubes, the blah, blah. Right. Now, each of those 27 SKUs had different labels because they were different products. Right. Maggie had its five flavors, six flavors. The soups had some seven, eight flavors, whatever. So each of those were separate. Now, for the packaging uh, purchase department head to spend time to look through 27 different types of packaging material for one group lying in different places in India, uh, small quantities because it's a newer business. You know, it's not it's not a milk business or something. You know, you you know how much is selling, etc. So you think there's more comfort in the system. He doesn't have that much time. So we used to sit down, uh, my team uh, along with me, to help them to look through where all it was lying, how much is there, what needs to be ordered. That wasn't our job. We were not responsible for buying packaging material. But 
uh, the, it, it, because we knew that nobody else will have the time to sit down and look through everything carefully. And you'll end up either destroying a couple of tons of packaging material, which will hit your bottom line, right? So you, you surrounded yourself with other tasks, which were not your main priority, to make sure that they got done uh, in the way, it, with the kind of time and attention that they required, right? So that, that was part of it. Now, today what has happened is uh, because of uh, a lot of digitization, uh, computerization, um, you know, it's easier to access information. You don't need to spend that kind of time on it. And jobs have got, become more sliced and diced. Uh, and they've become more complex. Uh, so with the uh, digital revolution, there's analytics, there's machine learning and AI. So there's a lot of consumer analytics. There's a lot of data. So you need a separate person to do just consumer analytics. You need a separate department to do consumer insighting, which is based on those algorithms. What are they throwing up? How are you then changing that for your business? Then you have a whole department doing digital, whether it's SEO or it's um, a CRO optimization or whatever it is. So there's so many different bits of it, you know, which... Uh, so actually, the role has become more complicated, I feel, uh, for people in marketing. And as a result, you know, they are, many companies are no longer calling them chief marketing officers. They are calling them growth officers. Uh, they are calling them CIOs. Or they're calling them a mix of uh, CMOs and CTOs. You know, so, I mean, they have to have a very deep connection with technology uh, to be able to manage their portfolio and yet have that creative spark in them uh, you know to guide agencies to do the design to creative which changes frequently because you're uh, you know you can launch a digital campaign technically one every day you know it's not like television where you're throwing big bucks behind uh, each frame of the commercial that you produce so i think there's a lot of churn and burn in the business which is a much higher order so it's a very different role today uh, but while I say that, I think there's some eternal truths, which is it's still about the consumer. It's about creating enduring experiences for the consumer. And I think if that needs you to go to the market to understand the front end of business, or it needs you to go and stand uh, and watch your product being produced in a factory because, you know, it'll help you uh, to maybe it'll spark some thoughts around how you should handle certain things or highlight certain things about your work, then do that. You know, that's that's necessary. So do what is necessary in the new environment is, is what I would say. But I find that a lot of uh, CMOs that I talk to sometimes uh, feel rather restricted because they say, you know, uh, they don't go into the market. They don't interact with the sales guys. Come on, if that guy doesn't sell, there's no point in your marketing it and vice versa, you know. So it has to be, uh, as we say, Mili Bhagat, right? You have to be in it together <laughs> to make it succeed. So I do believe that they, they should maintain that uh, involvement and that linkage. It's important. No, certainly. And, and you know, while, while you while you talk about your experiences or, or how the brand used to work then and versus how the role has changed today, um, you also, in the beginning of the, of the interview, called out as to how you wanted Maggie to become an omnipresent brand. And in 2015, you saw it everywhere. Uh, so your your uh, experience with Nestle was till 2000. That's and, right. Uh, you know, that's pretty much the entire life that Swaldeep and I have lived after 2002. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I guess the way we see Maggie as a brand is, I suppose, very different from the way you used to see it when you were working there. Right. So, so I, this, this is a personal question. How, according to you, has the brand Maggie evolved or how has it changed from the time you left it versus it is today? So, you know, when we, uh, uh, before I answer your question, let me give you a little anecdote. So, uh, when we launched Maggie and, you know, it had done well, etc., uh, we used to do all this market research to find out who is eating it. Okay, how much are they eating, right? And uh, we discovered that actually the adults were eating more Maggie than children. How much can a child eat? Yeah, he cannot eat two, three packets. He'll eat half a packet. The mom and dad would eat one and a half packets. We knew that. Yet, we focused on the kids. Why is that? We retained our focus on the kids. 
You know why? For several reasons. One was, of course, they 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 loved the product. They brought the product into the home. Right? The best of power was working for the brand. Number two, there was a, a natural addition to that target group every year. We were a growing population. We were adding then maybe more than 20 million, right? We were we are now adding maybe 15 million or thereabouts to our population still. So that was a growing target group. And uh, we said that this target group, as it grows and grows and turns into adults, that's when the adult population will become a part of the consumption in the communication. But we stayed focused on the kid, even though we knew adults were eating it. Now, when adults eat it, the brand has shifted its focus. It's become a family brand. So you don't, you no longer see uh, the communication with just kids. You see family consumption. You see adults eating it, uh, and you see kids eating it. And I have to hasten to add that two, three things haven't changed. One is the jingle. That signature music goes back <laughs> all those years to 1983. Can you believe it? I mean, that is amazing. The slurping of the noodle strand, that's still there, OK? And uh, I think there's a third thing which I noticed. So there was the music. Of course, the fact that you know, you're know you adding mother's love and her touch, which is, again, something which we had done in, in, in those early one or two years of, of launch. So, and, and the tagline, the two-minute Maggie or low-minute Maggie, that has been very, very, I guess, associative. Because now, if I, if I hear anyone saying low-minute, Maggie is the first thing that comes to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a little story there as well, Sahil. Shall I digress and tell you the story? Yeah, yeah. Please, please. I would love to hear that. So, no. So there was a lot of debate. Should we call it instant noodles? What should we call it? Why should we call it two minute? And there was a very clear logic. And we said uh, two minute, first of all, instant. You know, there were no instant foods. So what does instant mean? Last minute, 15 minutes, two minutes, one minute, five minutes. You don't know. So it's a vague term. OK, instant. Somebody will think instant means tear the packet and eat it. OK, so you kill the brand right off. Because if kids tear the packet and eat it, they say it's instant, they'll get a stomachache. <laughs> because it's it's raw noodles, you know, your brand is already dead in the water. So we said, OK, it's a two minute uh, cook up. So we call it two minutes. Two minutes also is a specific time. It seems short. Right, but you imply that it takes you two minutes, so people will read and know that you have to cook it. But the other beauty of it was that we had conceived this product to be a mass product, right? And we said, Can you think of a translation for the word instant in Tamil, Telugu, Bengali? How hard it will be, Punjabi? It won't happen. So, but the word two minutes, you don't need to translate. Because the number two is written there, and minute is colloquial right across the country. So this was another big reason why we kept the name as two minute movies. So because it's it doesn't need translation. So yeah, these are all these considerations, important things uh, to figure when you're working on a brand. Uh, so where were we? You were uh, I, I digressed with the name. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So the adults, so the family is eating it today, and. Uh, you know, they've introduced a lot of new varieties. So there's lots and lots of different kinds of Maggie, and I, I really relish trying them all out. Some excellent flavors. You know, but, but, uh, you know and, and this is this is where the marketeer in me comes in, the, the theory side of it. Um, the, the audience has changed. The audience is becoming uh, yeah, grown-ups now. And of course, a lot of kids eat it too. But where do you see it in the life cycle? You know, the product life cycle concept. Uh, where we introduce if it goes up and then maturity and decline for, for me the brand has since forever been on maturity right so, so how do you see the future of of maggie brand or maggie noodles maybe? so uh you know there's a whole concern around um there's an overriding concern around healthy eating now mm -hmm. and that may be one of the things that the brand seriously needs to address um and i it's like Actually, I say it with the fork tongue because uh, I'm not very sure whether they should or shouldn't. Because if somebody gave me a bag of chips to eat tomorrow, and I love uh, uh, potato chips, if someone gave me a bag of chips and said, I have put a lot of vitamin A, C, and B on it, now you eat it, I don't want to eat it. It's like telling me that on my plate of chart, you know, I can sprinkle uh, protein and all of that and then eat it. 
I don't want it, right? So I eat chart for chart and I eat chips for chips. But my food, yeah, I would eat a salad. I would eat something which is maybe roasted in the oven and not fried. Those kind of things I don't mind doing. So when I say uh, that they may need to work on a more healthy version, and they've tried that. They've done atta noodles and all of that. It's purely from this perspective of the housewife, you know, who says that, okay, this is a meal I'm going to make. So it's moved out of that snack positioning, perhaps, that we had launched it with. And it's perhaps become more of a casual meal. I mean, we just ate Maggie a couple of days ago. So uh, every once in a while, I give my cook a break and say, today, don't cook anything. We'll make Maggie. So uh, I guess for those occasions, you know, maybe they need to think about Okay. And, and here's a personal question to you, Sangeeta, ma'am. Uh, so when this uh, entire controversy cropped up uh, against Maggie, right? So did you, I, I'm sure you might not know what the, the executives might feel, but did you feel that, oh no, this is, the time has come, this is it, the end is near for Maggie? Or were you confident uh, uh, the, the brand would um, jump back? No, I, no, I was, I didn't think that far. I didn't think of what would become the eventual consequences. I was very concerned that there was no meaningful response in the first 24 hours from the company. And uh, I, I remember tweeting, messaging various people saying, please, you know, ask somebody to respond. Uh, because it just broke my heart to see the way social media was just tearing it down and the company was not responding. Um, but uh, true to their form, uh, they took their time, but then they came back in an amazing manner. And I think, uh, in order to uh, proceed with the, uh, uh, with the with the legal aspects of the case, the government asked them to remove everything, and they removed everything. I mean, that is really spelling the death knell on any brand, isn't it? When you have to take away every single pack from the country, so it just shows the strength, you know, that it has. And I think. Uh, 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 in large measure, that strength is because intrinsically, there's something in that brand which appeals to the consumer. So it's built on a strong foundation. And the company keeps sort of refreshing it, rejuvenating it, and it still resonates very well. So it's got a lot of strength. So I want to, uh, uh, in, in, this, in the context of this, I want to mention, in fact, you asked me this question about all the brands. So I, 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 I looked at uh, Tata Tea and Tata Tea, the Jagori campaign, which uh, I think we launched it in 2007. I remember the date. We launched it on 1st October 2007. It was the first commercial. Uh, it was still running till 2018. So when you, um, you know, when you innovate and you do, you create true value, long-term value, that's how it endures. So it was a campaignable idea which just kept going to different different heights and places every year, every two years. You know, since you mentioned Tata uh, and, and then you moved to Metal as well. And while, of course, moving to a different role in itself is a very monumental change, you moved from FMCG to the industry. The dynamics of it are entirely different. Right. And I, I can't imagine someone who has been in FMCG for, you know, 20 to 30 years, taking up an entirely different role and that to a CEO, that to a CEO. And I'm curious, how, how do you see how, you know, from the corner office's view, how do you, how do you sort of walk us through the differences between these two industries? Um, how do you go on about? So, uh, yeah, so I, before I go to the differences, let me tell you why I took that role. So, uh, you know, I told myself, looked at myself in the mirror one day and said, you've been in Nestle for 20 years now. Are you good for anything else? You know, is this it? Are you good for anything else? Okay, so let's challenge. Let's challenge yourself. Can you run a completely different business? <laughs> it's chalk and cheese, the two businesses. <laughs> so that's how I took up the Mattel role. And obviously, it put me in a leadership position. So that was the other reason why I took it. It paid very well. And I left my family behind in, in, in Delhi. Uh, but otherwise, it was really, really rewarding, uh, rewarding the role. Huge differences between the two industries. So FMCG, if we're talking about food FMCG, 
uh, FMCG in general is many times the size of the toy industry. The toy industry is uh, maybe, uh, if I have my uh, numbers correctly, it's, if I took the entire FMCG market, it would probably be 1% of the FMCG market will be toys. And toys per se as an industry is very, very, it has no, there is no concentration of uh, any large player. It's highly disaggregated, a very, very small, small businesses. There's some people who have gained in terms of size and they're more prominent, but there is there is nobody like a Unilever in the toy industry here in India. Right? Unilever is a, is, a, is, a, is a behemoth. Uh, so there's nobody like that in the toy industry. So a very different market, a very different consumer experiences, right? So food tends to be more, less fun, more serious, more repetitive mass, large scale, uh, make sure that your quality is always the same. And toys is completely different. It's about color. It's fun. It's a lot of innovation. Uh, it's about variety. And uh, I must tell you that um, in, in Mattel, we used to go once a quarter for the toy uh, for, for our review and we used to go for a toy presentation. And one of those meetings, they presented the entire range of Harry Potter toys. Okay, I remember I was 40 years old then. I was clapping like a five-year-old kid. They had done such a fabulous job of the presentation. So Snape looked like Snape. Dumbledore looked like Dumbledore out of the movie. And it was just astounding, you know. And then I went to see the design room for Maggie, for, for Barbie. And uh, they told me that we have 700 designers who work 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, uh, just designing. Okay. And this place was like a fairyland. It had so much color, materials, all kinds of trinkets, things they used to make the dollhouse, the dolls themselves. It was really amazing, you know. So it's really the toy business was about keeping the kid in you alive, right? That was that what that's what the business was about. And uh, being a CEO of that business, I was looking at. Uh, the business model, the, the overall strategy for the country, India. Uh, and I was looking at um, overall things, like whether we had the latest uh, technology to handle the complexity of the business, uh, whether we, you know, were, were in, we had set our strategy in a way that we could eventually make money, all of those things, rather than looking at a function. Ma'am, uh, while in your earlier stints, you were basically building brands in an organized industry, this toy industry, I, I believe at that time, was very unorganized, right? So you were organizing an unorganized industry in the country, in a way. Am I yes, correct but, in saying uh, this? Uh, well, no, I was not organizing the industry. I was working for uh, the world's largest branded toy business, which was Mattel, which was a $5 billion business. In, 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 in the subcontinent, I meant. Yeah, but in the subcontinent, I mean, this is an MNC, uh, so you have all their systems. You have so I'll give you a little hint. You know, uh, we were not allowed. No country was allowed to produce toys because toys need very fine tooling. Uh, the Barbie face used to go through seventeen paintings in order to make one face. Okay, so it's a very very intricate um, business. Uh, the dress used to go through a suck test. So if a small child sucked on the dress, no chemical went into its body. Right, no part came out of the fabric into the child's mouth. So there are many, many complexities. So you nobody was allowed to manufacture. Manufacturing was limited to a few centers, which were large scale centers, which had very fine tooling and could produce scale. And then everybody uh, got supplied uh, toys from those factories. So the whole nature of the business was uh, very, very different. So it wasn't. Uh, uh, it was uh, small and. Uh, unorganized in India, but not for Mattel. Mattel was very, very well organized in its approach to, to the business. Uh, the, the problem here was uh, we didn't have a good IT system. We didn't have a strategy which was going to take us uh, ahead into the future. So I, I re reset the entire strategic uh, uh, address in India. We set that strategy, brought in a lot of technology, linked us, linked the company to international systems, all of that. Right. And uh, with that, I believe we are kind of uh, approaching our last question for the season, uh, rather for the episode. Uh, from 1970s till now, you have seen the industries evolve, right? 
how how better things have become for women executives and how much more do we need to go how far do we need to go um so no there's a lot of uh, legislation i think which is enabling uh, uh, women and forcing companies to enable women in certain ways by larger maternity leave there's some paternity leave as well uh, etc cetera, etc cetera. but i think uh, there's still a long way to go and um, i think a uh, couple of things uh, especially since this is women's day uh, which i think we should talk to uh, it's important for uh, families uh, to empower women to make a choice a uh, lots and lots of women girls don't have the right to choose what they want some of them are scared to choose what they want and some of them just don't are not allowed to choose so they should be able to choose their education and choose the fact whether they want to work or not and uh, i don't think there's any imperative to work if you don't want to work that's fine stay home right and uh, that's your work then you know you, that becomes your major occupation is to run home run it well everything else but if you do want to work then i think it's very important for society for institutions and for corporates to support women to work and you know god has ordained that they produce the progeny and they produce children and that's bound to take up time and energy from them and so i think corporates do have to step up and say okay you know that's what you need to do you need to do that uh, in my time we used to get 3 months off and after that for one month i think i could come one hour late <laughs> that was it but now i know of companies where if your child is 2 years plus you take the maid you take the child with you on a trip i mean so there are all lots and lots of enablements there there's a law uh, around um, having a crèche in the office for for children and mothers being able to breastfeed uh, their child bring them to the crèche so there's a lot more enablement than there was at our time so uh, but companies do st still need to give them a lot of support uh, also women i think um, uh, you know uh, they they need to step up to the challenge so while uh, we are ordaining families societies institutions companies uh, to support them i think they also need to step up to the challenge because it's not easy uh, it's not a bed of roses uh, it's a lot of hard work because you get stretched in all directions uh, you know you run the home you do you do some of them uh, cook and come in the morning to work some of them who are fortunate have house help to do that but you do look after the kids you you do pitch in a lot more it's changing uh, shridi uh, so my daughter and her husband her husband pitches in a lot he's an excellent cook so most of the time when they're back from work they're very tired you know he'll stir the pot <laughs> while my daughter will take care of their little one so uh, they they pitch in together and that's a very very good thing so that, that, that's some really interesting conversation we had with you sangeeta ma'am and generally we close this uh, interview with a segment called what does the author read i see a lot of books behind you <laughs> oh. uh, which ones are your favorite books so which one uh, are the books you would like to recommend our our uh, audience uh, okay so no i have read uh, a fair number of books uh, but i must say that in the last uh, year or two my reading habit has uh, declined there are two reasons for that uh, one is I, i love to look after my little granddaughter for a certain part of the day uh, so i like to devote that time uh, to her and uh, two is part of my entertainment now happens to the ott channels uh, so <laughs> yeah and life is pretty busy <laughs> still but uh, i am right now uh, just trying to read uh, the tech whisperer uh which is a book uh, uh, because i i really feel that uh, people like me uh, i'm not a i'm not a engineer i'm not a technologist uh, i need to uh, keep myself abreast of what's happening and i some day have this hope that i will be a what they call a digital director so i i sit on various boards of companies and i want to be the digital director So I'm trying to read uh, Jaspreet Bindra's book called The Tech Whisperer <laughs> right now. <laughs> yeah, but there are lots of uh, I, I, you know, if I start telling you about the books, I'll be telling you about the old ones. So I'd rather not tell you right now. Uh, but there's so many interesting ones: the Google Story, the you know, uh, uh, 
Steve Jobs uh, book. Then I got this um, uh, Michelle Obama's book lying on my bedside table. Wonderful read, uh, you know, about uh, how she grew up and yeah, their life together. Well, thank you so much for that, ma'am. I want to say one last thing, if I may. Uh, sure, I, I want to yeah, I want sure, to leave, sure. I want to leave the session with a couple of quotes. So one is deliver what you promise. Two is if you want to leave your footprints in the sands of time, don't drag your feet. And the third one I want to say is walk the last mile with a song in your heart and a smile on your lips, and it will make it all worthwhile. <laughs> That's such a beautiful way to end this episode, Sal, isn't it? It is, it is. I guess that, that's how we should have started it as well. <laughs> but, but thank, thank you, you so much. much. It was a pleasure being here.